He's got no strings to hold him down. He also doesn't have a moral compass, consequences, or a cohesive plot in new versions. And uh, in the original Pinocchio, he's a killer who gets his own extremely angerable father thrown in prison, falls in with assassins, lives with a fairy, gets arrested, spends five months in the land of, uh, Bobbies? Yeah is sold to the circus, is perpetually haunted by a ghost, has a very strange sibling-parent relationship with a fairy, and so much more. So hey, fiddly doe, let's see where this will go. Do you ever feel like the plot of newer Pinocchios is kind of all over the place? Well, let's recap it quickly so you can compare it to the original. First, we spend 30 or so minutes in kind, gentle Geppetto's workshop where we learn that yes, he is very lonely. Poor guy. Then the blue fairy comes and the puppet is alive, then kapow, so much plot happens so fast. One minute Mary Sue Pinocchio is off to his first day of school, then he's an actor, then he makes a splash in his career, gets rewarded with more work and isolation for being such a special boy, and then escapes. And off to Jackass Island where all the cool kids get turned into donkeys and sold. Yeah, this is bleak. But not our special boy because he's wooden and the potion goes right through him. Or is in the new movie he doesn't even deign to really drink it? Then we're in the ocean. Geppetto's there and we've got to smoke ourselves out of a giant whale. And we do. Then we are a real normal boy and happily ever after. The end. Whew, cool. We're all caught up with that story. But see, chaos. And you know why? Well, the original source material for Pinocchio was not a single story, but a serial. So like a story article here, an article there. The original stories by Carlo Collati, who has a special Easter egg call out in this matchbox here, are from 1881 and set out to teach lessons to the young folks reading it. Hence why Pinocchio's nose grows from lying. It's essentially saying that you can't hide a lie for long, so just don't do it. Other fun lessons include eating all your fruit, not believing strangers, not going to jail, and not not offing people. <laughs> These stories were released periodically, took a pause, and were brought back due to popular demand. And they are something. The story gets dark and chaotic and starts off on a really weird, slightly awkward, dirty note. Before we deep dive into this truly grim story, this video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Old fairy tales can be weird, and when researching them, oftentimes I need to use a lot of uh, interesting search terms to find the best pieces and parts. This is where having Atlas VPN comes in handy. It offers private and safe web searches, so all the darker fairy tale research can stay, well, in the dark. I don't necessarily want that stuff following me around happily forever after. Atlas VPN also stops ads and malware at the same time, protecting your device and your data. It's also especially convenient to rewatch some favorites on streaming services that are currently not available where I'm at. I'm looking at you, Coraline. With a VPN, I can basically teleport to anywhere in the world and watch content available in that region. You too can get all this with Atlas VPN Premium for $1.70 per month for three years and six months for free with this 30-day money-back guarantee. Click the link in the video description below and grab this holiday deal right now. With Atlas VPN, you can protect unlimited devices too with this special deal, which is a limited time offer, so do be sure to check out the link below for a safe and secure new year. Thank you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Master Antonio, aka Cherry, so nicknamed because of his red nose, is about to turn a piece of wood into a table leg when he hears a voice crying out from inside of it? But where on earth can that little voice have come from? Is it possible that this piece of wood can have learned to cry and lament like a child? If anyone's hidden inside, so much the worse for him, I will settle him at once. Which in the story continually means hurt them. Yikes. So saying, he seizes the poor piece of wood and commenced beating it without mercy against the walls of the room. So he does that, unfortunate turn of phrase, then waits for the voice to speak again. For like 10 minutes. No voice. Decides to plane the wood for use, but lo, the wood says, Stop, you're tickling me all over. <laughs> I just can't with these situationally awkward phrases. And neither, it seems, can Master Cherry, who eventually decides to just give this talking piece of lumber away to the Geppetto we know and love. But not in this version, of course not. This Geppetto is an angry man with a great temper, apparently. Disney really mellowed him out and made his story a wistful, sad one. The neighborhood boys antagonize angry Geppetto by nicknaming him Pudding <laughs> because of his yellow wig. Stand up, chaps. Pudding, I assure you, is essential to our story. Anyway, Geppetto tells Master Cherry, you know what? I just had this wild thought to make a beautiful wooden puppet. One that could dance, fence, and leap like an acrobat. With this puppet, I would travel about the world to earn a piece of bread and a glass of wine. Oh, nice. Bravo, Pudding! <laughs> exclaimed the same little voice, and it was impossible to say where it came from. It's the wood, of course. 
I do love that in Pinocchio's rough form, he's an absolutely incorrigible jerk. Clearly, this story has more spice than Disney's already. Geppetto doesn't yet know this and becomes as red as a turkey cock from rage, as is his M.O., and confronts the carpenter for insulting him and presumably his dream. They fight. I mean fight. By the end, Master Cherry was in possession of Geppetto's yellow wig, and Geppetto discovered that the gray wig belonging to the carpenter remained between his teeth. <laughs> they were so angry they chomped at each other's fake hair. <laughs> so much for sweet old lonely Geppetto. Anyway, apparently during the fight, he would <laughs> whack Geppetto in the lake, and Cherry said it was not his fault, the wood had a mind of its own, and they get into a heated shouting match of knave pudding, donkey pudding, baboon pudding, and I find this very adorable, but Geppetto loses his mind after the third pudding insult, and admittedly, Cherry or the Enchanted Wood could have been more imaginative, and both men get scratches, lose buttons from waistcoats, and then abruptly shake it out with a promise to remain lifelong friends, as you do. Geppetto carries off his fine piece of wood and, thanking Master Antonio, returned limping to his house. Now, unlike in the Disney version of the movie where we have 30 minutes of emotional Geppetto time wistfully carving Pinocchio, book Geppetto makes very quick work of this. Good thing too, because there is just too much story to cover. Obviously, there's no blue fairy, yet, to turn the puppet to semi-sentience for his creator's good life lived. No, the wood was already sentient and kind of a jerk, so things happen light speed here. Anyway, this Geppetto can't even afford a fire. He paints smoke on the wall to give the illusion of one and warmth, poor guy. He decides on the name Pinocchio because of a family he once knew. There was Pinocchio the father, Pinocchio the mother, and Pinocchio the children, and all of them did well. The richest of them was a beggar. <laughs> Great start to a new life. But here's the thing, Pinocchio starts to attack Geppetto while he's carving him. Not sure why the old guy keeps on going with the abuse, but what's also great is that the puppet has, quote, wicked eyes, and its nose is already growing. Wicked wooden eyes, why do you look at me? No one answered. He then proceeded to carve the nose, but no sooner had he made it than it began to grow. And it grew and grew and grew until in a few minutes it had become an immense nose that seemed as if it would never end. <laughs> No lying needed, I suppose. Poor Geppetto tired himself out with cutting it off. But the more he cut and shortened it, the longer did that impertinent nose become. Then, the puppet whose mouth was not even completed when it began to laugh and deride him. Geppetto yells and the puppet sticks out its tongue like a brat. Geppetto keeps working, finishing the arms. Bad idea because the puppet grabs his wig. Not the wig again. Puppet gets scolded. Dad finishes the legs. Puppet kicks poor dad in the nose. Dad takes the abuse like a champ and sets out to teach the young whippersnapper how to walk. Bad idea because now Pinocchio is running through town within a few sentences. Pinocchio tries to dodge a soldier who catches him by the nose and returns him to Geppetto who is upset and tells the puppet threateningly, We will go home at once and as soon as we arrive we will settle our accounts. Never doubt it. Hearing this threat, Pinocchio throws himself on the ground and won't take another step, trying to forestall any due consequences. But the crowd is, of course, on Pinocchio's side. Poor puppet, they say. He is right not to wish to return home. Who knows how Geppetto, that bad old man, will beat him? And the others added maliciously, Geppetto seems like a good man, but with boys, he's a regular tyrant. If that poor puppet is left in his hands, he is quite capable of tearing him in pieces. Yikes! Yeah, this gets pretty bad, see? And worse, when the soldier sides with Pinocchio, frees him, and leads Geppetto to prison. Dun dun dun. Geppetto's like, all my dedication for this. Guess I should have thought it through or something. I would have had more to say, but alas. Anyway, it's time to go on to a bug killing spree. In the story's own words, while poor Geppetto was being taken to prison for no fault of his, that imp Pinocchio, <laughs> oh, I love this, finding himself free from the clutches of the soldier, ran off as fast as his legs could carry him. Once home, exhausted and sprawled on the floor, Pinocchio hears a talking cricket. And according to this illustration, it is one absolute unit of a cricket. Anyway, the cricket introduces itself. I am the talking cricket, and I have lived in this room a hundred years or more. Dang, surely a wise and magical companion if ever we've met one, right? Wrong. Now, however, the room is mine, said the puppet, and if you would do me a pleasure, go away at once without even turning around. Zing, Pinocchio. The bug refuses to leave until it has told the puppet a great truth, and Pinocchio's like, fine, but hurry up. Woe well, to those boys who rebel against their parents and run away from home. They will never come to any good in the world, and sooner or later they will repent bitterly. Ouch, bug. Very on-point and timely advice. What a great conscience you would make. 
Pinocchio is not having any of this advice, though, as he's already decided in his 20 or so minutes of life that school is not for him. He just wants to chase butterflies all day. The cricket warns him, poor little goose, but do you not know that in that way you will grow up a perfect donkey and that everyone will make fun of you? <laughs> Way to foreshadow Pleasure Island or the land of the Oobies, Cricket. Hold your tongue, you wicked ill-omened croaker, shouted Pinocchio. <laughs> The bug continues to say that only with an honest trade will the puppet be able to feed himself. But as all Pinocchio wants out of life is to eat, drink, sleep, and amuse myself and to lead a vagabond life from morning to night, the cricket's advice of all those who follow that trade end up almost always either in a hospital or in prison doesn't sit well with him. But the cricket's pity? Well, that's just a straw too many. Why do you pity me? Because you are a puppet, and what's worse, because you have a wooden head. At these last words, Pinocchio jumped up in a rage, snatching a wooden hammer from the bench and threw it at the talking cricket. Perhaps he never meant to hit him, but unfortunately it struck him exactly on the head, so that the poor cricket had scarcely breath to cry, gr 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 and then he remained dried up and flattened against the wall. The end. No rags to stylish clothes story for old Jiminy here. 100 years over. We need to talk about this anger management, Pinocchio. Disney does pay homage to this with the cat and the hammer and the cricket in their movies. So now with the only voice of reason dead and his dad in jail, Pinocchio realizes he is hungry. I was not aware that a wooden child needed sustenance, but hey, apparently he does. He goes to the stove to make some food, but remember, it's just painted to look like a stove and can't function. Pinocchio, hungry and bored, laments. The talking cricket was right. I did wrong to rebel against my papa and to run away from home. If my papa were here, I should not now be dying of yawning. And wouldn't you know it, he finds an egg in the waste bin. After kissing and caressing it, he sets up a very complex process for cooking it. And it's even more impressive when you think that the kid's been around for what, like a few hours now? But as he goes to break the shell, a chicken pops out. A thousand thanks, Master Pinocchio, for saving me the trouble of breaking the shell. Adieu until we meet again. The baby chicken goes away. Pinocchio is shocked, then extremely upset because he, uh, wanted to eat that, and now the poor wood baby is throwing another tantrum after the extremely polite bird left, the whole time thinking that if he hadn't gotten Geppetto locked up in the first place, he would not be hungry. No concern for his dad, just his stomach. So he ventures out into the streets to beg for bread. But this next chapter is called Pinocchio's Feet Burn to Cinders, <laughs> so you know things are um, heating up, and this story is getting dark. In fact, it was a wild and stormy night. The thunder was tremendous and the lightning so vivid that the sky seemed on fire. He's so hungry he braves the storm and knocks on an old man's door to beg for bread. The old man thinks this is a ding-dong ditcher and is not having it anymore. He convinces the puppet to stand under an open window and then dumps a basin of water on Pinocchio, who, returning home like a wet chicken, <laughs> props his muddy wooden feet up on a brazier of burning embers, which burn off to cinders while he sleeps the night away. Apparently he felt no pain, so why he feels hunger pangs is strange to me. Anyway, no time to dwell on this because Papa Geppetto is home. Open the door, he shouts from the street. But Pinocchio has burnt stubs for feet now and can't really walk. Geppetto's like, why can't you walk? And Pinocchio, for some reason, lies and says that the cat ate his feet. <laughs> well, that's a twist on the dog ate my homework, but don't bring the poor cat into this. I don't think his nose grows, but Geppetto's anger's already showing and he yells that Pinocchio will have the cat for me if he doesn't open that door. Yikes. But Geppetto is kind of assuming that this is another one of Pinocchio's tricks. He climbs in a window and yells and yells at the puppet until he sees that he's actually injured and super hungry, and so gives him three pears from his pocket. How kind! For how hungry he is, Pinocchio's super picky, saying he can't even eat fruit if it's not peeled. Geppetto accuses him of being dainty, but peels the fruit for the wooden boy, who can simply not eat the core, and they bicker more. Pinocchio is still hungrier than ever and eventually deigns to eat the cores and rinds. I guess this is a lesson in waste not, want not. So good job, Papa Geppetto. But we still need feet. Pinocchio swears up and down that he will be a good boy if Geppetto will only make him new feet. By this point, Geppetto's like, all boys promise to be good if they want something, but eventually gives in. And here's the thing, this is kind of a turning point for our puppet because Pinocchio does want to go to school now. Geppetto makes him clothes out of paper and sells his own coat so that Pinocchio can have a spelling book. The gesture is not lost on Pinocchio, who heads out the door and on to school, actually excited to learn. 
But of course, all good things must come to an end, and so does Pinocchio's educational endeavor before it even begins. On the way to school, he hears music and follows it to, he has to ask someone because he can't read yet, a puppet show. It only costs a dime, and the boy who read him the sign has no interest in buying Pinocchio's clothes, hat, or feet. For some reason, he offered those. But someone has an interest in the spelling book, and it's here at this point where the morality shifts again, a choice he can't take back. No thought of his dad shivering without a coat for a book he no longer has. It's not a scheming fox and cat that lure Pinocchio away from his educational path yet. It's his own curiosity. And once the puppet show begins, the actual other puppets themselves. Are all the puppets in this world magical? Cool. Anyway, they basically cajole and call out Pinocchio directly to come up on stage. Maybe they knew him from the soldier fiasco. He kind of crowd serves, pausing the show, causing the showman, whose name is Fire Eater, which is awesome, to come out. Now, the way this story describes Sky is amazing. An ink black beard that he always steps on, a mouth as big as an oven, eyes blazing like red glass lanterns, and carrying a large whip of snakes and foxes' tails, which he cracks constantly. Yikes. He kind of sounds like a cuphead boss. I love it. Well, actually I don't because he uses the constant thread of this story. For disrupting my show, tonight we will settle our accounts. Which means rather than becoming a star performer in the puppet show, Pinocchio's dry wood body will do nicely to cook up this guy's lamb dinner. The Harlequin and Punch who first called Pinocchio out of the crowd in the first place hesitate, but what can they do really? They retrieve Pinocchio who was hanging from a hook. Long and short of it, Pinocchio impresses Antasticus, Fire Eater, who resigns himself to simply eat half raw mutton. The next day, Fire Eater gives Pinocchio five gold pieces to give to his beggar father Geppetto, which the story does not make a big deal out of any of this, but to me saying it out loud it absolutely seems like Red Flag Central. Anyway, I'm sure it's nothing. He sends Pinocchio on his way home, but wouldn't you know it, Pinocchio runs into a sly fox and a crafty cat. I was wondering when these two would show up, pretending to be blind and crippled. Pinocchio has plans for his money, though. I intend to buy a new coat for my papa, made of gold and silver with diamond buttons. For five gold? Where? And then I will buy a spelling book for myself. They convince him that education is what made them go blind and injured. And wouldn't Pinocchio like to double his money? They pitch him on a scheme in The Land of the Owls, where he could turn five gold into two thousand in just two days. Basically, it's Animal Crossing. You plant your money in the field of miracles, water it, salt it, and eventually it will turn into a money tree. Nice. Well, Pinocchio thinks it is and that they are genuine, so onward! To the Inn of the Red Crawfish we go, where the fox and the cat who are in with the innkeeper, wink wink, order the most expensive food, of course, and leave Pinocchio paying for the meals and rooms. Pinocchio, for as impishly rude as he was earlier in the story, is very, very naive. So he sets out to the Field of Miracles alone in the darkness when the ghost of the talking cricket speaks to him, telling him to at least take the four remaining gold to Geppetto, please. Pinocchio ignores the advice, to which the cricket cryptically replies, Good night, Pinocchio, and may heaven preserve you from dangers and from assassins. <laughs> what? Then he vanishes. But he spoke true because this next chapter's called Pinocchio Falls Amongst Assassins. So buckle up! Pinocchio doesn't believe he will meet up with assassins because, quite frankly, he doesn't believe in assassins. <laughs> Cricket Ghost, sure, but assassins, no way, bro. He thinks they are like boogeymen or something invented to scare girls and boys. Of course, though, out of the gloom appeared two evil looking figures completely enveloped in charcoal sacks. They were running after him on tiptoe and making great leaps like two phantoms. In sepulchral voices, they said, Your money or your life. Whoa, assassins! Pinocchio can't reply because he has shoved the money in his mouth. One of the assassins goes for it there and Pinocchio bites off their hand. Well, paw, because of course this is the cat and the fox, now one at least truly injured. They try to burn him out of a tree and eventually Pinocchio runs to a house where a beautiful dead child with blue hair answers the door. It gets weirder, trust me. Everyone inside is dead and they will not let the puppet in. Meanwhile, the assassins have caught up and try to stab Pinocchio twice, but their blades break because he's wooden, of course. So instead, they hang him from a tree. Look, this makes no sense. They hope not that he will unalive, but that he will please politely appear so and open his mouth so that they can get the money out. Yeah, they'll be back tomorrow. And I wasn't worried about the wooden boy not breathing, but this story is saying that his sight is going dim and that he can't breathe, so now I am? Fortunately, the dead child in the house is a fairy and sees him out their window. 
They summon a falcon to break the rope. Next, the fairy summons a poodle named Adoro that walks on two legs, is dressed in coachman livery, a wig, waistcoat, etc. Anyway, Midoro is tasked to retrieve Pinocchio in the finest carriage pulled by 100 pairs of white mice. Move over, Cinderella. Once Pinocchio is inside, my oh my, this fairy had a change of heart. They summon the finest doctors in the area, a crow, an owl, and THE talking cricket to see if he's alive. The first two speak nonsense, but the cricket, he has some words. Basically, tells the room how awful Pinocchio is and what a bad person he will grow to be. This makes Pinocchio cry, which maybe was the intent, I don't know, but he's alive now for sure. But that's short-lived and he's about to really die, all because he won't take his bitter medicine. Typical in many ways in this story. He bargains for sugar cubes first, then says that the pillow is uncomfy and cries, etc. I just... Anyway, he embarrasses himself with whining in front of the fairy who's like, Look, you're going to die if you don't take this. And so Pinocchio dies. <laughs> the black rabbits come with the death stretcher and then he agrees to take the medicine. Why? He says, we boys are all like that. We are more afraid of the medicine than of the illness. Which again, I just... The fairy's like, that is so unwise and I agree. Anyway, they ask Pinocchio to recount the story up until this point. When they ask where the money is now, Pinocchio says he no longer has it. But his nose grows, so we know he's lying. So much so that he can't walk out the door. And the fairy is just amused by this, which good sports, I guess? The fairy teaches him the dangers of lying and sets him on his way home with the warning of not to get sidetracked. Which, if you've been paying attention, you know he will, and of course he runs into the fox and cat not two steps from the big oak tree where he was dangled the night before. The cat is missing a paw. Hmm, suspicious. Anyway, Pinocchio is naive, and because the fox tells him the field of miracles has been bought, they must hurry to plant the remaining money. The story is especially eviscerating a Pinocchio at this point, saying he had not a grain of sense and no heart. Ouch. Anyway, they convince him to dig a hole and bury all his money in it. We know where this is going. Back in town, Pinocchio daydreams about his riches, doing sums and doubling his thousands, which is impressive when you consider he hasn't gone to school yet. He goes back to the field to water his money, and a parrot in a tree laughs at his gullibility and tells him that the fox and cat ran off with the money. Pinocchio goes to report the theft to the judge, an ape, who hears the story and then sends Pinocchio to prison for four months. <laughs> it would have been longer if not for the emperor's victories being celebrated in the town. Anyway, only if Pinocchio declares himself a criminal will he be released, so he does that. On his way back to the fairy house to hopefully see Geppetto, Pinocchio runs into a huge scary snake in the road, and he kills it. Well, more like the snake went into convulsions of laughter and left until he broke a blood vessel in his chest and died. And that time, he really was dead. Why? Pinocchio tripped and the serpent thought it was funny. Cool. Skipping right along past that to where Pinocchio gets hungry again, goes to reach for some roadside grapes, and gets caught in the polecat trap. Whoops. The pain is unbearable even for a wooden boy, and he gets busted by the landowner who is really rough with the puppet, throwing him around and standing on his neck. It's… it's not great. Also, apparently his watchdog died today, so Pinocchio will take the dog's place tonight and they'll settle their accounts, again yikes, in the morning. He puts a spiked brass collar around Pinocchio's neck and chains him to a wall, telling him to bark if he sees any robbers. Pinocchio, understandably, feels more dead than alive and vows to be better and cries himself to sleep in the doghouse. And, wouldn't you know it, the robbers appeared not two hours later. Apparently, these polecats had an arrangement with the previous dog where they could take some chickens each week. Pinocchio is not about that lying life right now, so he bark, bark, barks to alert the field owner. Yeah, he really does deign to bark like a dog, poor puppet. The owner catches them and will send them to be skinned and cooked at the inn. Yikes. He then caresses Pinocchio, ew, and impressed by his loyalty, removes the dog collar. It seems that by being a rat, Pinocchio has done a good deed. Finally, he can continue to the fairy's house, but in its place is a very passive-aggressive grave marker. Here lies the child with the blue hair who died from sorrow because she was abandoned by her little brother Pinocchio. Ouch! He cries, kisses it a thousand times, wishes he had died instead of the fairy. Seems like a selfless change of heart. A pigeon carries Pinocchio 600 miles to the shore so he can look for Geppetto. He barely sees Geppetto's boat on the water before a storm comes and a wave takes the boat underwater. But Pinocchio, made of wood, leaps in to save his dad. That is the last time he'll see his father for two years. He swims all night, ends up on a narrow island, talks to a dolphin who tells him that it's likely that Geppetto was swallowed by the great and terrible five stories tall dogfish. Oh no! 
he finds the village of industrious bees where he is absolutely a fish out of water. It's full of busy people who try to teach the lazy puppet any sort of work ethic. He begs for food, but they will only give him coin for work, which he just can't be bothered to do. There really are some choice lines like, My boy, if you really are dying of hunger, eat two fine slices of your pride and be careful not to get indigestion. Zing! Anyway, he eventually trades work for dinner and turns out this woman who made him dinner is the same blue-haired fairy from before. You know, the one who just died and there was that passive-aggressive gravestone? Well, yeah, she's alive and older, too. Do you remember? You left me a child, and now that you have found me again, I am a woman. A woman almost old enough to be your mama. Pinocchio is like, sweet, I've always wanted a mother like real boys, can you be mine? I guess that's a yes, because he calls her little mama from now on, like that's not strange or anything. He asks if he can grow like her, and she says first off, that's a secret, but secondly, no, because he is a marionette. Only if he becomes a man by learning to be a good boy will his wish to be real come true. And now you can really see where Disney got their inspiration for the Blue Fairy from, right? She sets some ground rules. School, tomorrow. Pinocchio resists, but he really is sick of being a puppet, so agrees. School is torture for a lot of people. Pinocchio, surprisingly, does well academically and earns the respect of the bad boys by throwing a punch and a kick with his hard wooden feet. And he's got the respect of the teachers, too. What a guy. Problem is, quote, he made too many friends, quote, and some of them were up to no good. Like Candlewick, remember him from the movies? Anyway, they convince him to skip school one day and check out the dogfish near the shore. In hopes of finding his father, Pinocchio runs there first. But it's a trap because they're sick of him being a goody two-shoes. And it's seven versus one. Pinocchio actually defending education, so that's great. But no one is going to defend him now, but that's okay because he's made of wood and absolutely destroys the boys in combat. One kid throws a book that misses Pinocchio but catches the temple of another boy who is in really bad shape. So much so that when soldiers appear on the beach, they arrest Pinocchio. He tries to escape, but the soldiers send a freaking mastiff dog after him. Pinocchio only escapes by jumping into the sea. So does the dog, who starts to drown. Pinocchio is all for letting him drown, but has a conscience now. He saves the dog before swimming to a safe location. Instead, he's netted by a monstrous fisherman who has the appearance of an immense lizard standing on its hind paws. <laughs> And of course, who wants to fry the puppet for dinner? Pinocchio's like, I'm a puppet, not a fish, but the man is even more ready to munch on this new type of food. He strips the puppet and coats him in flour, and just as he is about to drop Pinocchio into the frying pan, that mastiff appears. One good deed deserves another, and Pinocchio is back in town, where he learns that everyone thinks he tried to off his classmate and that he is bad, bad news. Basically, everything he's been working to change about himself, they pin on him, and that's gotta sting. He dons a sack of beans as clothes and is too humiliated to go back to the fairy's house at first, but gets hungry. A snail has to open the door, and that takes nine hours. The fairy sends him down food, which turns out to be cardboard and plaster because she is upset. She'll give him one more chance to behave. And he does, for the rest of the year. And tomorrow, she will grant his wish to be a real boy. But of course, something comes up. Yep, it's time for Pleasure Island, or as this story calls it, the land of the <laughs> Bobbies. Pinocchio tries to invite his BFF Candlewick, this version's Lampwick, the laziest and naughtiest boy in school, of course, to his real boy celebration tomorrow. Instead, Candlewick invites Pinocchio to live with him in the most delightful country in the world, the land of the Bobbies. <laughs> oh boy, here we go. Pinocchio declines but waits with his BFF for the coach to arrive. When it does, it's pulled by 24 donkeys wearing men's shoes. That's grim. Pinocchio, of course, eventually gets swept up in the excitement of it all. Being a vagabond was his very first goal in life, right? When one of the donkeys misbehaves, the driver bites off half of its ear. It appears to cry later, too. Probably should pay this more mind, Pinocchio. Away we go to spend five months on Pleasure Island. Not a few hours like in the movie, but months. It's all boys between 8 and 14, and it's pure chaos. Weeks fly by like lightning. The whole Bobby Land plays out exactly like in Disney's versions. I think they really had the most fun making the scenes, and it kind of shows. So you know what's next. One morning, Pinocchio turns into a donkey. His friend, a marmot, informs him that he has donkey fever and only has two or three hours left until the transformation is complete. He rushes to Candlewick and they compare ears, and while it's funny for like a second, they both turn into full-fledged donkeys. None of this ear and tail only business. The coachman comes to collect them and sells Candlewick to a peasant whose donkey had died earlier that day from overwork. This does not bode well for Candlewick. Pinocchio is sold to a circus director, and so begins his life of actual work and eating hay. 
long gone are the days of peeled pears. He also has to spend the next three months learning how to jump through hoops and to waltz and polka, all while being beaten till his skin is barely on. Yikes. Finally, it's time. The famous little donkey Pinocchio called the star of the dance will make his first appearance. Read the promotional posters for the show. This, I'm thinking, is where Disney got Pinocchio's stardom arc from. Yeah, he's got no strings to hold him down because he is a donkey who hops around on his back legs. He looks, um, fantastic. Mane divided and curled with bows, flowers, ribbons, and braids, silver and gold bedecking his body. He trots, bows, plays Jed, all the tricks. Then he looks up into the box seats and sees a woman with a medallion with his puppet face on it. It's little mama fairy looking down on his humiliation. Then she disappears, and so great is Pinocchio's despair that he hurts himself jumping through the hoops. Aww. The vets say he'll remain lame for the rest of his life, and so his circus days are over. Anyway, unable to perform, the circus sells Pinocchio not for 20, but for $2 to some guy who wants to buy him to use his skin to make a drum. <laughs> Yikes. This guy wastes no time. He ties a stone to the donkey's neck and pushes him into the water, waiting for him to drown. After 50 minutes, the guy decides it's time to check on the donkey. That seems like overkill? <laughs> anyway, instead of a waterlogged donkey, he pulls out a live, wriggling puppet. Pinocchio's alive! How? Oh, buddy, let me tell you. Apparently, Little Mama Fairy sent a shoal of fish to eat the donkey flesh away when Pinocchio was underwater. Ears, tail, fur, everything chomped by the fish. Mmm. But when the fish reached the bone which is made of the hardest wood, they gave up and just the puppet was left. The would-be Skinner gets to hear all of Pinocchio's adventures up to this point, lucky guy. Then Pinocchio jumps into the sea and swims anywhere when he sees a goat. But not just any goat, it's the beautiful child with the vivid blue hair, aka the fairy, his mother and sister. He swims faster to reach her but gets intercepted by the dogfish and root. The goat pleads with the puppet to swim faster, but no joy because the dogfish eats the puppet eventually. Did you know that the dogfish suffers from asthma? Well, you do now because that's why it's super windy in this belly. File that one away. Pinocchio starts talking to Toonie, a tuna fish, and then sees a light in the distance. It's Geppetto! He's been in this two-mile fish for two years! When Pinocchio reaches him, it's of course tears and joy, but also weird because Geppetto was eating raw and wiggling fish a la Gollum style. They cook up a plan to escape and do. Pinocchio swims with his dad as far as he can, but just when they are both about to die, that Toonie saves the day! They both climb on its back. When they get to shore, Pinocchio kisses the fish's mouth in gratitude and the fish emotional hides underwater. Is this where Disney's bashful Cleo comes from? Now, here's where we get all Frodo and Rivendell, or Dorothy after Oz, because, you see, we meet everyone again at this, the end of all things. Some of who, um, were dead? Anyway, Pinocchio gets to put everything he's learned during this super long adventure to the test. They come across the villains, Cat and Fox, who are now unfortunately actually blind and tailless. Pinocchio has no sympathy for them. They come across a little cottage, and who lives there but THE talking cricket! No longer a ghost, and on good terms with Pinocchio now. The blue fairy goat gave the bug this house yesterday. How convenient. Pinocchio wants milk for dad, so trades honest work for it, and it's here that he finds his friend Candlewick the donkey, who is dying. So yeah, that's kind of a bummer. This cottage situation continues for five more months, Pinocchio taking care of his dad, until one day he runs into the blue fairy mama snail, you know, the one who took nine hours to open the door, who informs him that the fairy is in the hospital. Pinocchio sends money to her and has a very industrious night making baskets. And then the fairy appears to him in a dream and thanks him for helping his parents, aka her and Geppetto. When he awakes the next morning, he is a real boy, and Geppetto is well again and woodworking away, and next to him is the original Pinocchio puppet, lifeless and goofy. Is it weird to have your old body just hanging around? Anyway, the end of this creepy Pinocchio story. It's so weird and I kinda love it. Pinocchio doesn't really have any real meaningful consequences in Disney's newest live-action adaptation of the movie, and that's kind of contrary to what the original story set out to accomplish, right? They have their wooden boy as a Mary Sue, a character that can do no wrong and is just perfect as is. Yes, he's supposed to be wide-eyed and innocent to the real world, but he also has no negative consequences for some of his arguably poor choices. He runs off and joins a puppet show. The consequence? He is a showstopper, great, and coveted, so locked up for safekeeping. He never feels bad about leaving his creator father Geppetto. Doesn't know he needs to, maybe? It kind of makes his characters blink as the wood he's carved from, honestly. 
Contrast that with this original story where there are so many examples of consequences for Pinocchio. Some are creepy, some far-fetched, but all are memorable. That makes sense as it was used to entertain kids and to teach them some things along the way. Like how he got his conscience in the first place? He got annoyed and killed a cricket, whose ghost now haunts him, guiding him in the right direction. You can see how Disney absolutely, well, disney this cricket as a conscious concept by assigning a poor cricket to a prestigious role at the outset of their story. Pinocchio is more of a bystander in his own new Disney movie, and there's no meaningful exploration of what is right, what is wrong, but that's why we have this old jam of a story. But what is your favorite part that maybe you didn't hear of before, or your favorite part that is in all the stories? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you, friends and fiends, for sticking around for this whale of a tale. Do subscribe so you won't miss the next creepy weird story. Goodbye.